Um, all right, people are trickling into the webinar. We've got about 20 people. Um, participants, if you want to just type in where you're logging in from, what you're drinking, if you got a beer in hand, and uh, we'll just give a couple of seconds for everybody to log in, and then we'll get going. In the meantime, I will open my good robot 10,000 pound Pilsner brewed with Raven's Floor Malted Pills. And then once that's poured, we'll get ready to start chatting about all good things, malt and flaggers. Cheers, Stefan. Thank you. Gave myself some nice wet <laughs> foam like into this one. That looks, that looks good. Thank you. I, for, I forgot to bring mine, sorry. <laughs> All right, so let's get this kicked off. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Stefan. I'm going to be the host. I'm a technical, technical sales manager at Brew Culture. Got to remember my title for when I do these. And this is a webinar about traditional Czech style malts and the lagers that we can brew with them. I am joined from by Brew Culture's good friend Morgan Wheels Goss. She's the co-founder brewmaster at Good Neighbor Brewing in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Hi, Morgan. Hi, everyone. As well as Thomas Caranda, technical sales manager and all knowledgeable Czech ambassador for brew culture. Uh, hey, Thomas. Hey, Stefan. Awesome. Nice to, nice to not see you all, but hopefully <laughs> we will see some of your questions, hopefully. Right on. Um, so thanks for being here. Let's uh, just begin this with uh, talking a bit about you, Morgan. Can you tell us about yourself and your new project, Good Neighbor Brewing, and your little brewing system you got there? Certainly can. So yeah, Morgan Wheelgaz. Uh, originally started my brewing career out of uh, Toronto, Ontario with Amsterdam Brewing Company. Uh, was with them for just over a handful of years and moved out to Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is where we currently are. Um, and this past week, actually, um, Good Neighbor Brewing Company, which is uh, our new brewery, um, we just launched our product uh, live to market. So uh, we are currently contract brewing out of a local guy uh, looking for our own location, but uh, we're doing a wide portfolio, which will range from uh, you know, some hazy, some sours, obviously, Pilsner, um, kind of my go-to style. Um, back in 2018, so my history with loggers briefly is back in 2018, uh, that's when I met Thomas. Uh, we, I was part of a, a Czech trade mission uh, with about 10 other guys uh, throughout the industry in North America. We visited Czech uh, for about a week there, really getting the ins and outs of the Czech brewing culture. Um, met a lot of great brewers, brewmasters, uh, maltsters, hop growers, um, really submersed in that um, and kind of deepened my passion for brewing lagers. Um, so we'll get into a bit of some of the recipes and, and just techniques um, from what I've learned and, and from what I know and I kind of go from there, so. Awesome. Thanks. And yeah, I can't wait to get into the brewing specifics of this. Um, I will just tell everybody that's listening, if you have questions, there's the Q&A section as well as the chat. I'm monitoring both. We've got a um, secret monitor at the back too, one of uh, from Brew Culture who's monitoring them. So we'll catch your questions at the same time. If we can answer them while we're talking, we will. If we um, can't, we'll try and answer them through the Q&A section or just by writing to you. Uh, but feel free to throw whatever questions you have our way. And yeah, without further ado, I will pass this off to Thomas to introduce us to Raven Maltz and start talking about the Czech style malts and lagers. Thanks, Stefan. So uh, just let me introduce uh, rather quickly. My name is Thomas Koranda. And uh, I've been in touch with Stefan, Daniel, of course. And uh, as Morgan said, we met uh, back in 2018 in Prague. Uh, my role in uh, our company is quite a, a wide range of activities. Uh, as uh, I wouldn't say I have uh, one specific role as we are quite a relatively small family business. So uh, it's not like a big corporate uh, company. So uh, I'm taking care of, uh, of, uh, of the malt quality, 
for uh, export as well. So uh, I I would say I'm I'm the number one contact uh, processing all the deliveries and uh, taking care of the fact that uh, you would always get the the same and uh, the best possible product from us. So if you are not satisfied, you know who to. It's your fault. <laughs> it's my fault. <laughs> Yeah, so so that's that, that's quite it. I have more other activities, but they are not related to today's topic. So I would stick with this, uh, if it's fine. And uh, yeah, uh, we can we can uh, start off. Stay yeah, fun. right on, yeah. definitely. Um, so I think you have a couple of slides for us that you can share. Just talk about um, you know general general stuff about the company, where you where you guys are from, what makes it particular um and all that good stuff right yeah yeah if, if possible i would like to talk about it because I, I i still believe that it's important for you to know uh the background of the of the malda house of, of the company to get some idea at least so uh if i may i would like to introduce our two founders uh, of the company we are still quite a young company uh around 30 years uh, in the making i would say uh, because, as you know, we, uh, there was no private equity in uh, Czech or Czechoslovakia before that. So our founders, they started uh, right away, I would say. Uh, and uh, yeah, I will maybe share the screen so you can see their actual faces to make it uh, easier for you. Hey, yeah, we see them. So, yeah, so if you come come by, you, you, you will surely be able to meet uh, our two founders, Aleš Přenostil and Antonin Kolman. So they both together, they have uh, combined knowledge in uh, brewing beer and uh, malting for 100 years, 50 years from Aleš in the malting uh, area. Uh, so he started when he was already 14 years old. Now he is 65, so it's 51 years uh, today. And uh, Antonin, he, he started also 14 years old with uh, Aleš in, 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 in the school as, as a friend. And uh, yeah, he has, he has been a brewmaster uh, ever since. And uh, so these two are the source of our all knowledge and uh, experience. And uh, we try to convey it further on and keep the, keep the company and the knowledge running for the future as well. Yeah, and uh, just for you to get a quick look how the, how the Maldahaus looks because I believe it might be quite interesting to see it live, but uh, obviously it's not the case now with all the restrictions, et cetera. But uh, I would strongly recommend if you have a travels to check, uh, please let me know or Daniel know, he will let me know. And uh, I'll be really happy to walk you through the whole production. And uh, you could you could see the, the malt as well. We can taste the beer. So we can have a quite nice nice day, I believe there. And you, you have a brewery attached to the mall house, right? So you can yeah, test sure. everything and perfect the recipes and the malting. Yeah, um, sure. Right on, that's exciting. Yeah. yeah, both the brewery and the malt house are from 1890s. Uh, so it's 130 years old. Uh, of course, the, the technology uh, is uh, very much changed today. Uh, but we still believe to keep the processes which are uh, which are, we we try to stay true with with the processes the technology has to move move forward of course but uh, we make it the way that we don't compromise on the processes uh, that we stick to so like you're the floor malting and uh, and decoction brewing etc et so yeah floor malting the technology has remained relatively the same am i is that correct yeah, the, the, the specific step of the germination that remained the same. And uh, I, will, I will speak about it later. I will uh, maybe just talk about it quickly. Uh, also, I will talk about the, the barley, which is uh, uh, very important, if not the most important part of it. So, uh, yeah. But the, the general thing, I, I think the top, topic of today is a Czech lager, correct, Stefan? Yeah, so, check lagers so, and the malts that we need to brew with them. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we can start with the Czech beer and uh, go go from there and uh, get the idea what the Czech lager is, uh, and then maybe I like understand the sound of that. that. 
why the ingredients are important. So I, I prepared some slides as a background. So if you are okay with that, Stefan, I can put it there and we can talk about it. So uh, maybe you can you can tell me your your experience with Czech beer. For me, living in Czech, it's uh, it's quite easy to come across Czech beer and Czech lager styles everywhere. Uh, but uh, I would be really interested, maybe what's your point of view, or what's your perception of Czech beer in terms of the whole world of beers? Uh, what's your perception of it and uh, what what's good about it, what's bad about it? For me, it's very interesting to know from uh, somewhere outside of Czech Republic. Morgan, you want to take that on to start with and I'll add what I have to add after? Yeah, I certainly can. I think... Uh... I mean, depends what you look, if it's macro versus micro, because I think we have this kind of vision of uh, what macro producers have, you know, credited as Czech beer or Czech style beers that, you know, certainly not full body, um, definitely pale color, um, bitterness, little to none. Um, I think very mundane, but you see this kind of transgression as of recent to uh, kind of craft breweries. And I see Erica McCoustra is on here um, out of Steam Whistle. Um, kind of craft breweries like that who have actually taken the Czech style um, and brewed it to uh, its original um, intent, which beautiful full body, um, you know, it, low to mid bitterness, very balanced, uh, beautiful foam, just beautiful clarity with it. A lot of depth and character on the mouthfeel. Um, and I'll say this before the trip to Czech Republic back in 2018, um, you know, brewers, brewmasters, you study the style um, from books, you figure out the techniques from books and literature, and then you submerse yourself in the Czech culture. And it is just a bit of a, uh, almost an uh, experience, like life altering experience. Um, <laughs> what true Czech pivovar um, is so it's it's yeah it's tough so kind of drawing from that experience and now what we try to implement here it's yes yeah. yeah to be honest uh, as, as you described these these macro lagers uh, i would say there was a, a period of time maybe 20 years 15 years now and uh, uh, even the big, biggest uh, breweries of course not pills now etc but uh, many 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 industrial breweries they they were trying to divert to these macro lagers as you described and uh, it sort of uh, allowed the craft industry in Czech to flourish I would say it was the it was the beginning of the craft industry because they uh, the, uh, the craft breweries they reintroduced the traditional uh, traditional processes the original recipes original raw materials and uh, yeah so even now the industrial breweries they realize they have to really uh, you know Put up some fight to, to get back uh, to the top of the pedestal so uh. yeah and you know i think it's the natural progression of things you know when you look at the history of this beer style um you know it took over the world like everybody wanted to replicate it right from the get-go right like um as soon as you know czech style lagers came to be in their pale colors the Germans wanted to replicate it. And then that just, you know, exponentially exploded across the world when, you know, North Americans got into brewing and then, you know, you, you know, the big booms after the world wars and stuff like that. And now we're at a return to form, which is so wonderful. And I think in North America, we, we lack a bit of the background knowledge of, you know, where all this came from. And to me, to brew this properly, we really need to understand the ingredients, the barley. Um, so I'm going to take you right back, Thomas, to that, that slide with the map. I want to know why this is, you know, called Moravian malt and they're called Bohemian pills. Because quite frankly, I had never heard the word Moravian before we started having these conversations. And you know, I've been brewing for 10 years and consider myself a, you know, a big beer enthusiast. And for me to not know a word that I'm going to talk about in a webinar, it was kind of you know, I was like, ow, I don't, I don't know everything. I need to learn more. So let's take it from here. Tell us like the difference in the geography and then how that impacts the grain and then 
how we end up with the product that we end up with to make these great beers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I don't think there is any shame, Stefan, not knowing it. So don't worry about it. <laughs> so I, I guess it's just lo our local thing to to uh, sort of talk about geography. But uh, I, I think it's very important when we it, it's related uh, to the beer quite uh, significantly. Uh, I hope you see see the slide now with uh, with the map of Czech Republic. So Bohemian part, as you call Bohemian Lager, uh, it was original kingdom of Bohemia historically 1,000 millennia back uh, with the Bohemian kings, etc. And uh, that's why it was eventually called Bohemian Lager because Pilsen is located in the western part of Bohemia, but most of the malt actually comes from the eastern part from Moravia. And uh, you would see, for example, that the Budweiser Budvar, they always claim they use Moravian malt. So uh, we are very proud of that. The reason, of course, being uh, geographically, it usually is linked to the uh, uh, climate and, and the soil you have uh, at hand. And it, uh, it brought up many generations in the history uh, in this agriculture seg segment of growing barley. And uh, there were actually uh, there uh, actually seven, six, six, seven kilometers from our mud house in Zahlin, so the red, red dot, there was uh, inv invented or bred the first modern barley, brewer's barley variety in the world. So not, not I, I believe nobody knows that <laughs> nowadays because it's already back from 1884. Uh, and before that, the, the barley was uh, very hard to to get the yields from, to be used in the brewery effectively. Uh, so it was actually, this modern variety was uh, bred uh, right next to our malt house. So we are quite proud of that fact. Uh, yeah, and since then it, uh, it boomed, the, the whole industry boomed. It allowed the, uh, the farmers to have bigger yields. It meant for the breweries to get, uh, to get better yields, to produce more beer. So really this, this, uh, this fact I think is very important not only for Moravia and Bohemian Lager, but eventually was very important for the whole beer industry in the world. So it's quite not known, but it's sort of a fun fact now, I would say. Yeah, and so it, I think it's so important that you guys actually created a seal of, of approval for your barleys, is that correct? And your malt? Yeah, it's, uh, there's a seal of approval for uh, a beer when we talk about Czech beer there was uh, created a protected geographical identification of uh, Czech beer, similar to, for example, Champagne. So uh, you would have uh, this, this mark of uh, Czech beer and uh, it, uh, it allows you only specific barley varieties used uh, and uh, specific uh, processes and raw materials, of course, such as sas hops to be used. And uh, it clear, clearly describes uh, how the style should look and uh, which barley could be used and called then the beer, Czech beer. And uh, yeah. So, so most what of, barley most varieties are we talking about when we get to that? Yeah, they are, they are not just one or two. They are uh, more specifically, I don't know, from the back of my head, but uh, uh, it's more than five, less than 10. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But uh, we, you know, the farmers tend to focus on uh, one, two, two or three main uh, barley varieties. So we, of course, uh, uh, tend to use these. Uh, they are used same by Pilsner Urquell, Budweiser Budvar. So these these breweries they use uh, use the variety that we we provide you as well, of course. And uh, uh, and uh, yeah, most of the best barley. Uh, always comes from Moravia. So we are thankful for our location that we are located in the middle of Moravia in the region of Hana, which is uh, the, the, the best uh, ba brewer's barley growing region in the Czech Republic. So we can source the barley quite easily and we have the farmers around so we can visit them, they can visit us every time. So it's a perfect setup for us. So what are the particular specifications of the barley that we're looking for to make it, you know, this, this, to make the seal of approval? Is it, is it actual analytic parameters or is it a flavor or a combination of both? 
it's uh, it's more uh, technical, I would say. Uh, of course, the the flavor uh, comes with it as well. Uh, but uh, most specifically, what we are when we are talking about it, the, the Czech uh, Czech beer, the Bohemian Lager, is as Morgan said, it's it's not kind of a macro lager. It's more full bodied. At least it should be full bodied when we talk about lagers. And uh, the barley itself uh, tends to be uh, less uh, less modi modified when uh, when we do the germination. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it brings also lower attenuation levels, uh, final attenuation levels in the beer, which equals uh, the, the full body in the end. So these are, I would say, the, the key differences uh, because then uh, industrial brewery, when they want the, the best efficiency, best beer stability, uh, the fastest production, they would aim uh, for example, in Holland or in France, they would aim for different barley variety. They would aim for something that is highly, highly modified and, it, and uh, doesn't bring that much uh, extract uh, like proteins, etc. They just want really like uh, more on the watery side of the, of the beer, just produce it quickly and uh, let the beer flow. And I'll, I'll just jump in here. Like I had to do a lot of research to get up to scuff with all of this. So when you're talking about modification, if someone's looking at a C of A, um, in North America, traditionally, we're seeing this as S over T, or we're seeing it in the cobalt index. And, you know, as a reference point, I, the Czech malts are around 34, 35 most um, North American two rows are well up in the 45s. Um, so it's just like this 10 point gap, which is relatively large and you can taste the difference essentially um, once you start brewing with these and you can see it, the difference in your final gravity as well. Yeah, of course you, it's, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's the key fact. Uh, yeah, it's hard to talk about it more. It's, no, it's basically fine, just numbers yeah. that, uh, yeah, it, as you said, callback index is is uh, is the measure to look at, look at uh, the parameter to look at, of course. Uh, we use also different uh, measurements, uh, for example, RE45, which is like relative extract, uh, but it's, uh, of course, linked uh, with callback index. It's, uh, uh, it's a similar parameter, just different number, but it says the same uh, same thing. So with our malts, we we focus, as you said, around 35 uh, uh, 35 callback index, uh, which is just on the borderline of uh, uh, like under germinated, uh, under modified, sorry, under modified, and uh, well modified. So that's our sweet spot, I would say, where we want to be. And uh, yeah, that, that allows us to, to get the bodiness of the, of the beer that we, that we want in the Czech lager. So then how does the floor malted Pilsner differ from the non-floor malted? So from here, we know our variety has a specific lower modification potential. Can you talk about just the process of malting and how, how it differentiates the two finished malts? And then we can talk about how we use them in a brew house. Yeah, yeah, of course. So. Uh, so the floor malting, uh, very very easily uh, summed up, is uh, that we we are not using industrial production. We are using the floors, uh, as I as I showed on the on the pictures, and we lay it just to the very uh, thin uh, or shallow layer, up to 18 centimeters. It depends, of course, on the weather, on the temperature in the in the uh, area. Of course, if it's if the temperature is higher, then we have to make the the layer more thin. Let's say, so it's sort of a uh, you need to get some expertise to it uh, to be really good on in judging how to adjust uh, how to adjust it. Uh, but in general, we let we let the the grain uh, naturally modify. We don't add any uh, any oxygen to it in uh, industrial malt houses. Uh, uh, you have the at atmospheric air put into the into the grain in a in a higher layer, and uh, they also usually aim for high modification there. Uh, 
because it goes the, the malt goes to industrial breweries and uh, they always aim for a bit higher modification than, than we do. Uh, we, we tend to you know, modify the malt less to get even more body. And uh, that's, I would say, the, the differentiation. It's related, of course, as well with the, with the color a bit, because if you, if you modify less, you get uh, less uh, precursor uh, uh, compounds for the Maillard reaction later on. So, uh, of course, the color is a little bit paler. We can be around three EBC of the sweet wort, laboratory sweet wort, and uh, industrial, industrial uh, Pilsner malt could be around four. Uh, you can, of course, make, make, make up, uh, if you want uh, a higher color, you can make it up with, uh, with adding Munich malt, what we, for example, do sometimes in our beers. I will I can show you later what we do in our beers, our lineup, what we what malts we use, and uh, how we produce it. So uh, that's uh, and we use only our malts in the beer, so we can always uh, have a double check, not only visual or laboratory, but also in the in the brewery. So yeah, in general, the the floor malting uh, results in uh, it supports the the what you want in the Czech beer. It supports the fact that you want a lower modification, lower attenuation, full body. So that's that's what we aim for in the floor malting. Perfect. So let's let's get into some brewing, like some some brew house applications. So Morgan, let's let's hear how you've been using it. I know you've brewed um, the style of malt and various methods across various breweries. Uh, can you just share those experiences with us? And then we'll see how close you are to uh, Thomas's recipes and process. <laughs> Bring on the big test. Uh, yeah, so I've used uh, Raven malt now for over a year and a half um, and other floor malted uh, Czech Pilsner malts in past, um, ranging from decoction to infusion. Um, so I have a bit of variety on, on just the mashing uh, regimes for those. Um, so we can start with the decoction if you guys want. Um, and that was most recently, I've always done at least a single decoction method uh, where possible. Um, but obviously after this trip to check and, and understanding that two decoction or double decoction and triple decoction are the minimums for most brewers over there. Um, made the switch over to that. Um, usually starting just with uh, the protein rest, um, pulling off a portion of mash, bringing boil, um, bringing that up to uh, anywhere from 60 to 62 C rest, uh, pulling off second portion, uh, raising that between 68 to 70 C uh, rest, and then strike out at you know standard 76. Um, so I've found Quite a lot of differences. Um, I know there's obviously theory and, and scientific approach to does decoction mashing, um, what effect does that have with obviously well modified malts, but since using Raven and, and using that kind of lower modified, um, I've seen a lot of great uh, impacts to uh, these pilsners that I've been brewing. So um, I, I'd say descriptively the beer styles, um, every time uh, trying to create these recipes, it's very much to mimic that um, that true traditional Czech style. Um, full rounded mouthfeel, very complex, deep, rich notes. Um, I found that obviously decoction method, whether or not um, modified or unmodified, um, really aids with that regardless. I think there's a bit of that caramelization approach um, to that. Uh, with the Raven malt specifically, um, I was trying to read through some literature that we visited the Czech um, Institute of Brewing and Malting um, while we were there, and they had a lot of great research on just decoction mashing and most recent information coming out of there, um, which has been great to kind of compound with with what we're creating. Um, so with decoction mashing, it, it's just I know. Um, Theoretically, I, I just love it. Uh, I find that it really does like it produces such a fantastic kind of rich depth profile to to the mouthfeel. Um, I've, I've 
read that um, kind of literature becoming high to support that is um, increase in polyphenols with the number of uh, decoction mashes that you do um, provide in your in your beer, um, which I think is great because that can add to kind of that um, chemistatic sensory feel of that astringency that I think can kind of offset that deep richness that can come through the decoction, really balancing out the end profile of the beer. Um, I know there's obviously um, literature to support that there's an increase in nitrogen production during the decoction mashing, um, which overall just, you know, you're looking at your foam retention, you're looking at just the healthy, um, healthy fermentation of these lower modified uh, malts. Um, overall, just really producing this, what I would get as close to as a Czech style beer as, as what we can. So um, comparatively, oh, sorry, go ahead, Stephen. I was, I was just gonna ask, so like I, we just got the poll results and we had a lot of infusions, a lot so many uh, decoctions. And I know you just built a, yourself a little brewery. So, um, you know, in North America, I don't think it's like the off, the, off the press to get a decoction system. So can you, can you tell us about like what, what, what you sourced, what it looks like and how, how like the different vessels and how it impacts your day really? Like, is it, is it truly like an extensive labor of love that's unsurmountable or is it something that you could fit in a day? You absolutely. You argue, yeah. Arguably can certainly fit it within a day. Doesn't okay. take, uh, I'd say at most an hour extra um, to perform it, depending obviously what type of system you have, if it's steam or obviously electric, maybe not so efficient, but um, system I've used in past, I've had uh, four vessel systems where there's been a subsidiary um, fifth vessel off to the side that you could run off um, boil mash and infuse back into the mash. Um, currently, I have a little pilot system, a nano system that I can draw off the main brew house, uh, run decoctions off that and um, exchange it back in. Um, obviously, people would be a little um, constrained if, if you're working off a two vessel system, even three vessel, but um, I have had in past run off from mash tun into kettle if I am working with a three vessel system um, and then pumped back into the mash. So um, it is definitely possible. Um, obviously you, you're trying to deal with scorching issues uh, depending on, on uh, whatever jacket exposure you have, but um, it's definitely doable. I think there is that argument, oh gosh, it adds too far on the day, but um, it's also a labor of love if you want to do the style right and you have the ability to do it uh, that way, that technique, then give it a roll. Why not? Nice. Cool. Thanks. Um, so Thomas, what is this in line with what, what your recipes look like? Yeah, 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 it's uh, it's perfect how Morgan describes it. So uh, yeah, it's, it's correct, and uh, it's not that lab more labor intensive uh, than it might sound. We always uh, get our brews fit in uh, one working uh, shift uh, from the morning to the afternoon. So uh, even if we do two decoctions, we can fit it no problem. Uh, we actually use two vessel brew house with a Whirlpool, of course. So we have a mesh tan and a water tan and, uh, and a whirlpool separated. But uh, I know that uh, when, uh, when a producer of the brewery uh, builds a two vessel brew house, they don't uh, think uh, about decoction when they produce the brew house. You might have to ask specifically the, the brew house producer, please uh, make it so that I can do a decoction. So it requires to have some additional ways how to repump it uh, from uh, from uh, mesh town to loader town and and back so the, the, the there are some additional uh, uh, there are of course ways how to do it on two vessel but it differs brewery to brewery so uh, i believe it should be doable always with some technical changes but uh, yeah but anyway, you can, uh, if you do infusion, uh, it doesn't limit you uh, in using our malt. Uh, you can use it, of course. The decoction would make it uh, the best possible product. 
but if you are technically limited, of course, there is no, no other way to do it, then it's understandable, but it doesn't uh, leave you out uh, in using the, the floor mount. So um, it, would it be fair to say that the non-floor malted would be more suitable to infusion, um, just where it might have a bit more modification to get you there? Yeah, it, it, it might be um, more fit to that. Uh, yeah, so yeah, you will describe it quite correctly. And then I also just, while well, we're talking about mash profiles and, and this kind of, this whole realm. So if you're in a, obviously brewer, I'm just going to caveat with, obviously brewers are creative. So if they really want to pump stuff around, they'll hook up a couple of hoses and that portable CIP pump and figure something out. Like I'm sure um, people can get creative. The other thing I've noticed is that a lot of, like I get to see all the breweries now. So, I, and I talk to a lot of breweries and a lot of breweries have a pilot system and a full system. And honestly, some pilot systems look like they're the right size to actually pull some liquid off, boil in there and do your decoction with your pilot kettle and throw it back into your mash because we're generally talking about like 30 percent that you're boiling is that a fair statement yeah you should do the calculation what what volume you you transfer because eventually when you put the the parts together you you, you should achieve the, the the correct temperature so you have to have this uh, there is an equation to that so you can quite easily calculate the the volume uh, because you would be, of course, uh, uh, warming it up to the boil or close to boil to 100 degrees Celsius. So what you mustn't do is to pump too much to, to warm it up to 100 degrees and put it back. And then you would, you know, the, the resulting temperature, you would overshoot it and, and miss the sacrification temperature. So you have to be very specific what volume you but it's around one quarter. Yeah, uh, one quarter, one third. Yeah. Okay. Um, and someone just mentioned something here. Tyler threw up in the questions. Um, so it's kind of like a reverse single de decoction that he's saying. So on a two vessel brew house, transferring 90% of the mash to the lauder and then boiling that last 10% in the kettle mash and then transferring over into the lauder ton. So it would be like, at the end of the process, you're not necessarily doing a mash off. So you're going to allow something to continue happening in your lauder ton, but it could give you, you know, that Maillard reaction and that caramelization that you're looking for um, in an event where you don't necessarily have the, 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 the equipment or the patience to kind of monkey around a different way of pumping beer back and forth. Yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. That that's 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 the way how to do it. What 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 you eventually need to achieve, uh, in in fact, is uh, to have this uh, thick, uh, you know, ward with the grain, and put it through boil, and uh, and just to have a have a uh, have a share of it uh, boiled, to really get this caramelization and this this process go, uh, going on. Uh, so, yeah, certainly it's a, it's a way how to do it as well yeah so as we move along here if you really are limited and can't do that there's there's malts that are designed that are malted in consequence of giving you more of those flavors like um they're they're a lot more present in the you know in the european style malts that we're purchasing um so the melanoidin malts are essentially designed to a certain extent to replicate that decoction flavor is that is that right to say that? Yeah, sure. It's it's uh, what we are talking about when uh, doing decoction is always a Maillard reaction. So it's uh, uh, the Maillard reaction is supported with several parameters. The higher the temperature, the higher the content of water, the more of Maillard reaction is happening. So these two parameters, if you combine them together, are ideal in decoction because you get 100 degrees Celsius and it's in the world. So you get perfect conditions to that. Uh, when we want to achieve it uh, and not having this possibility, of course, as you say, melanoid in malt is a, is a way to achieve it. Also Munich malt, for example, because in general, these, these specialty malts, uh, what, what differs uh, with these 
is uh, is the fact that they are undergoing the Maillard reaction in the grain at some point of production. For Munich malt is, for example, uh, in the in the kiln mostly. Uh, we steep it a little bit more, leave there more water, of course. As I said, it, it brings more um, of my art reaction. Therefore, we steep it a bit more, and uh, then we finish it off in the kiln. With melanoid and malt, it's a very specific approach where we uh, put, the, put the malt on the floors to the relatively high uh, layer, maybe one meter could be. And we let, let the temperature inside that layer rise to 40, 50 degrees Celsius. So that's something you wouldn't do when you are producing Pilsen malt. You would, you would not be aiming at the temperature. And what it allows is you have the grain, which is steeped uh, around 45, uh, 48% of uh, moisture. And then you bring it, and as it germinates, it it generates heat, CO2 and heat, it, it breathes. It, it's a living organism, uh, essentially. So you put it together, keep them together, and the temperature rises to 40, 50 degrees. And what, what's happening is with this moisture, you get this, uh, res uh, the, the resulting products of the Maillard reaction. Yeah, so it, it mimics what's happening in the, uh, during the decoction. So as you say, yeah, if you do, uh, infusion, you might add some some uh, some specialty malts like this. What we we do it as well, in, in some some of our beers, I, I can tell you which what, which malts we use. Uh, I can give you the specific recipes. Yeah, I've already so, shared your pale lager recipe in in the uh, in the chat, and we'll be sharing a couple of other recipes uh, as we keep going because we're going to talk more about uh, some specialty malts and the different styles. So. Everybody's very familiar. Obviously, we've been talking about, you know, Bohemian pale lagers, uh, but there's a whole other world of Czech style beers that are out there. And I know, Morgan, you have dove into at least one style. So do you want to tell us about um, the, the other kind of Czech style beers that you've brewed so far, Morgan? Yeah, so I brewed uh, kind of straight pale lager and then kind of dove into uh, Czech dark, uh, dark lagers. So um, Played around with that. Never really what I felt has gotten to that happy point of, of final products. Um, played around with a few specialties, had uh, floor malt like Raven as uh, base malt, um, still went through decoction methods, um, had some melanoid in there as well, just layer uh, amongst some other specialties. So um, really trying to get that again, that very true to tradition Czech style at dark lager. Uh, again, beautiful, like full body mouthfeel, quite flavorful, but, um, and complex, but falls off the palate in a way. Um, they're a lot of fun to play with. Um, I think, again, you can just kind of layer richness over richness and, and flavor over flavor uh, with those styles of beers. So Thomas, you want to walk us through like how to say the words and what they mean and what color they represent in these beer styles? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I try to put it together so it's the, the most simplest way possible in one, in one, <laughs> one, one slide. So just awesome. Them. So, so there, there has been a change uh, lately, two years ago, when I, where they, they changed the names of the categories. So I, I just put, put down the basic categories of Czech beer styles as how we call them in, in, in Czech. So in general, if I'm not talking about non-alcoholic beers, of course, it's not possibly what we are talking today, but uh, we start from six plateau. Uh, we, we don't, don't usually use uh, OG in, in, uh, when talking about the, about the category of the beer, we, we talk about plateau or uh, extract, extract of original part. So we start at six plateau and go up to 13 plus plateau. Uh, it, it, I, I saw it uh, nowadays maybe uh, happening more that uh, even the craft breweries, they, they go lower with the plateaus. They are trying to produce uh, lighter, lighter sort of beers, which are also, uh, which have been uh, produced historically in, uh, in Czech Republic. So there's nothing new about it. Uh, it just uh, uh, is something which is re-emerging today, I would say. 
And based on our conversation, these malts are super well designed for these styles of beer because the biggest biggest deterrent we often say about low ABV beers is that they're thin and that they're lacking, you know, full body. And here we are saying, well, this floor malted Pilsen malt is low modification. So it's in, essentially intended to leave that, that rich full body. So as that trend continues across the world, because we're seeing that in North America as well, this is a great avenue for this type of malt. Mm -hmm. Exactly. What, what you said, it's, it's true because we, we just uh, happen to brew uh, non-alcoholic beer uh, in our brewery. And we have a first final, uh, it's a batch that we, we would like to sell and and uh, I have to say, it's it's uh, it's not thin beer. Definitely, we we approached it with uh, like brewing normally. We don't machine at 70 degrees or whatever. We we start lower, and uh, we even do decoction for that because eventually we want to have a non-alcoholic beer, which is still have a lot of uh, character and and full body. So I have to say, we were very satisfied. So. If you have a chance to visit, we will have a non-alcoholic beer for sure. And, uh, we, we can we can taste that. Yeah. So we no, use one hundred percent. We use one hundred percent our floor malt, and uh, and we are very very happy with it as a resulting and, product. And then when we talked a while back, you had mentioned that you know the trend is to go that the lagers kind of fluctuate over the year. So in the winter, you know, you're going to be brewing a pale lager at a higher OG. And then in the summer, you'll brew similar beer, but at a lower OG. So that's kind of the seasonality of, um, of the pale lager. So there's a winter version and a summer version. And then there's the colorful versions to complement those. So I think those were at the bottom of the chart. Um, the words are just not sure I'm going to pronounce them, but the Palatmeve and the Mave, um, those would fall into amber and dark uh, styles. So I think you shared some recipes with me. So do you want to just talk about them a bit? I'm going to throw them in the chat so people can uh, take a look at them and we can understand a bit what process is used to brew those uh, from a traditional perspective. So I have it in front of me. Uh, I can share them now. It's no Perfect. problem. Yep. It's I, it's even better. I hope. Just let me get to them. Uh, yeah. Just give me a second. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I hope you can you can see that. So. I just tried to put together uh, some recipes. I, I believe, uh, Stefan, you can you can send it out to the participants or anybody who is interested. There's no issue for us. So I I put together uh, recipes of our three uh, three beers. I we have nine beers in in the range, but I think these three are uh, what defines the style. You have a pale lager. You have a, a polotmave, amber lager, and you, then you have dark the, uh, the tmave. And uh, so for a Bohemian uh, Pilsner, we uh, we either do 100% uh, Pilsen floor malt, uh, or we use Pilsen floor malt and add uh, Munich malt as to as to some, uh, somehow boost even the character and the color of the beer. And for the hops, we of course use uh, Sass. Uh, or we use also Sladek and uh, we use them in separate uh, different uh, points of, uh, of the hop boil. Uh, we start with uh, Sladek to get, of course, the, the bitterness. And then we, towards the second part of the hop boil, we, we use Sass to get the aroma, which is Sass, of course, known for, for, for its aroma. Uh, so for, for uh, uh, the Bohemian Pilsner for the Sveti Lejag, it's you can see that the, the the raw material list is very very short, and uh, that's because you actually doesn't need uh, it to be that complex. What you want is uh, is full body, drinkability, and uh, and that's that's what uh, what what is driving this beer style. Of course, we can do double single decoction. So I just uh, wrote down. Uh, the process that we use, the, the steps we use, the temperatures we use, 
So anybody who is interested and able to do it, they can double check and uh, check with, with their approach as well. Awesome. Thanks. It's, it's really, it's really nice of you. And it's, it's, you know, it's not every brewer that wants to throw down a recipe like that pretty much word for word on how to do it. So very appreciative of that. Yeah. And uh, so I will just have a quick look at the, at the recipes of, of the others because they are more, more complicated in terms of malt bill. Uh, so for example, for the Ember Lager, we use Pilsen floor malt, Munich malt, Malanoidin malt, and uh, three caramels. And as you can see, what we also a bit changed a bit, uh, that for example, when you want to reach high, higher color and you don't want to have this uh, sort of caramelly taste, uh, you know, this caramel taste, you can even put uh, the, the specialty mods in the low drain phase. So- Yeah, I discovered that recently and that's interesting. So not only does that impact the flavor but also impacts like the astringency and harshness that you extract from those deep roasted malts Is this, that's correct yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's what we use specifically in the in the in the dark beer in, in, in Tmave Pivo where we use uh, again a uh, mix of, uh, of of the malts and why we do it is is that each of the malts uh, it it, uh, it shows different taste different character color so it, it really creates those layers of uh, and depth of the flavor. And when you take a sip, you, you, can, you can sense uh, the presence of each mouth, maybe at some different point of, the, of uh, maybe 20 seconds, 30 seconds that you, that you perceive the taste on, in your mouth. And, yeah, uh, I always like saying it's, it's like this curve when, when you're tasting really malty beers that are complex, like, like these, it's like you get that initial punch of that dominant flavor and then kind of like oscillates in and out as you have that sip and as the beer warms as well. So uh, these brewing techniques definitely look like they'll add to that um, layering and, and like sensory experience. Yeah. And as you said, Stefan, what, what we do is with a, with a dark beer, uh, we... We don't put the, the high roasted uh, malts like roasted barley, roasted wheat malt. We don't put them in uh, when we do the meshing in. We put them uh, for the lottering phase to get the color, but uh, avoid that uh, that uh, astringency, that that uh, harshness uh, that might the, that uh, they they might bring in. But still, you get this uh, chocolatey taste of the roasted wheat malt. Roasted barley is, is uh, I would say, the most harsh, uh, harsh of, of all of these. So you have to be very, very sensitive um, when, uh, when uh, putting together this malt bill. So as you see, this 4, 4.5 kg per hectoliter of uh, uh, roasted barley is, is quite a lot, but it's in the lottering phase. That's very important not to, uh, because then you would, you would create completely different uh, character of the beer. Which might not be that pleasant uh, eventually. So can you just? I'm just going to back up for one thing. Cause you said something. And I want to make sure I understood properly. So your roasted wheat, um, it's almost similar in color. It's way up there, and you know the 300s lovey bonds probably are even beyond that. Um, would that give you the same kind of color complexity and the same flavors, but with less harshness? Is that what you, you're kind of saying? Uh, yeah, you would get maybe less color if you put it in the in the meshing in phase, because then you would extract more color, of course. But with it, you would bring in uh, the the astringency and bitterness that you uh, you wouldn't uh, like to bring in. So it, it's not good, you know, to undergo this whole uh, whole brewing process with these roasted mouths. If you do, for example, decoction, etc., it's it's perfect in the lowering phase, then you would get the, the best character of, of these roasted mounts. So it's Morgan, to... had you tried that when you did your tmave? No, not with this. I've, I've done it in past with other, uh, other like North American and Euro styles, but um, it's pretty interesting that, yeah. Cause I think one of the biggest proponents is that astringency factor um, and how to offset that. And I mean, that's fantastic knowing that 
you have to go that heavy in loudering phase to to extract that amount but not get that astringency so that's pretty great yeah i like that thanks uh thanks thomas that's some good insight i don't think north american brewers necessarily know about this like it, i i recently fell on this and i'm very excited to actually brew something that does that yeah it's right you, you can you can try it of course the way you want it's it's craft uh, industry you can do it your way it's just what we do and the recipe we fine-tuned over many batches so we think this is this is the best in our point of view everybody has different point of view different uh, taste so and that's good but oh yeah for sure but this is you know when you're looking at bjcp guidelines this is what'll get you true to style right like and you know that might be what you're striving for as a brewer is to brew true to style and then other times you're gonna you know strive for true to a flavor profile that you want to go achieve so um it really depends where you're starting from and what what your end goal for a beer like this is um, we are almost out of time. That was lovely. That was just a monumental amount of information that you two shared with us. But I always like to finish off on a, on a, on a note that kind of inspires people and kind of throws them into their breweries. So I want to know what you two are excited to brew next with, you know, after talking about Czech malts like this, what is, what does that make you want to brew? Is it true to style? Is it using this malt in a different avenue that you know just makes it shine or brings something else to life what are your thoughts morgan you know what i have used this floor malt uh on a farmhouse style um food or age farmhouse which a lot of fun with um i know we spoke back stefan a couple weeks ago just how cool the under modified uh would be for that fooder it was a fantastic beer um so I think for everyone, like you're not limited just to specific Czech style beers uh, with the style malt. Um, but for the summer, really digging in to try these low ABV beers, been plugging away over the, the winter to dial something in, but um, picking Thomas's brain on uh, really nailing that down would be pretty great. And kind of going that slow alcohol way that everyone's uh, kind of moving towards. Right on. What about you, Thomas? Yes, uh, as Morgan said, uh, as, and as I said before, we we see the non-alcoholic and low ABV beer market is is really booming. You know, it's something natural, I, I think. But uh, yeah, we have to accommodate to that. Uh, but at the same time, I have to say we were quite <laughs> quite surprised when we created a low ABV or non-alcoholic beer with uh, with uh, in our brewery. You know, we we had a <laughs> we had a meeting and. Uh, eventually, uh, over the course of one hour, we drank five liters of it. <laughs> in <the top> of <laughs> so we were kind of felt guilty that uh, you know you are sometimes talk about non-alcoholic beer in a in a way that uh, it's something bad in the industry. But uh, uh, eventually, you can appreciate it uh, as well. So I oh, wouldn't absolutely. be worried about it. Just yeah, just go Hi. for it. Try it. It's, it's I great. think marketing wise and just where we're at in the world, people are looking for that a healthy alternative B that social drink when we can be social again. Um, and yeah, it's just a great, it, it, I'm happy to see the non out kind of come to life again in, in North America, as well as all around the world. Um, as for me, when we talk about these beer, like this mall, like my mind just starts churning. It's like, there's so many beer styles where we're striving to have this, this body left over and this like full mouth texture, like mouthfeel texture, like I'm thinking pastry stouts and hazy IPAs. Like, you know, if, if you're not brewing that with a, with a malt that's going, that has low modification, then you're, you know, putting extra challenges to yourself sometimes. And I would have never thought of this before having this conversation. But what I truly want to brew is Admave Bivo, just dark, Czech style lager that just, you know, right at the top of its ABV in the, in the style range, but just, you know, finishing clean and not getting that astringency and trying to utilize that lotter ton um, heart, grain addition. Like that to me sounds like heaven right there. It is. 
<laughs> awesome. And I've had a few, a handful of them in my life, but I can't say that it's widely available right. here. Yep. You have to visit. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait. It's, <laughs> it's on the, it's on the to-do list. So thanks so much, Thomas Morgan, for your time. I know, you know, brewers are busy, you know, I know everybody's got hectic, hectic days. I know there's a time zone difference. So Thomas really appreciate that you could jump in. I know it's probably late in the evening for you. Um, so thank you and for sharing your knowledge and passion. And I'll just wrap up a bit um, with a few information pieces. So for anybody who was who's listening to this later on YouTube, uh, if you want some of the recipes that we talked about, feel free to email Brew Culture. Um, you can email me, fan at brewculture.com, and I can hook you up. Um, and we also had a contest for a Luker faucet. Um, we will be looking at the attendance after we shut this webinar down and we will be sharing the winner on social media within the coming days. So stay tuned for that. Awesome. And with that, I wish everybody a good day and have yourselves a nice beer. Yeah. Cheers, everyone. I'm Cheers. having one right now. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, guys. It's All evening right. for me. See you guys. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>